Should we do an introduction as well? Uh, I guess the first thing we have to do is uh, bear forgiveness that uh, it has been that long without the team talk <laughs> somehow. I don't know, on our knees, on it the floor. Matter, it's that long ago, nobody knows that. <laughs> we just call it Team Talk 1 again. Team one, Talks. 1B. One <laughs> No, we should do some kind of introduction, but... Welcome to Team Talk 14. Many episodes now, we have lots of things to cover. We are in a new place, as you can see, completely new. So I guess that's also the first topic. We moved the office, or the office moved, or how do you say that exactly? We moved with the office. We did. Everybody moved. Yes. So there are some pictures of us trying to get the huge pick and place machine out of the old office, mm -hmm. which was assembled inside, and that way nobody <laughs> thought about how wide the doors would be and how wide the machine would be, so it didn't fit. I wasn't there, fortunately, as it seems, <laughs> but I, I haven't been around a lot lately, so you have to really get me up there. Terrible, terrible. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll try. So, what we did was we flipped the machine over and you turned it through the door, basically. Mm -hmm. Did it fit into the elevator? Uh, yes, okay. luckily. Nice. That worked. That's good. Yes. <laughs> and we brought all the stuff here because our new office is located in the so-called Vienna Factory Hub. The cool thing is it's not just a co-working space. Like, there are a couple of, where you have startups and people working on different projects. Every desk or every room. Mm -hmm. But as it's called Factory Hub, we're actually inside an electronics manufacturing facility. <laughs> yeah. And we will get up out of this room. But and this is not the official. Edition. Take you on the tour afterwards. Yeah. This is not the official assembly room, say, because we're not wearing any protective. Yes, we will we'll put that on later yeah, when we go a, get serious. Sure. Yes, <laughs> but this is actually the place or the, the space where the cameras are being made now. Now. <laughs> right now. You will have to do it afterwards. Okay. <laughs> yes. We're actually standing in front of our new office, Factory Hub Vienna, which is in the 23rd district of Vienna, so the more industrial area. Yeah. Lots of different manufacturing facilities around here, industrial area. And? And our office. Yes, it's inside <laughs> the Telehase production facility. All right, Should right. take a look inside. Let's go inside. The building is actually so huge and long, I think that a small airplane could easily land on the roof. Could <laughs> be. All right. So, if you want to go into production, yeah. You have to be properly grounded okay. first. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, let's, let's touch What's Earth properly. <laughs> Get in line with Earth and everything. So, put your feet into the front. Yeah. And the back. And pull back. Okay. That's it. The then? Umbilical cord. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the umbilical cord goes in your socks. Okay. Nice. Hmm? that you are really grounded. Now they have test this. cats where you can try. <laughs> if your hair goes all wild, then not properly grounded. But first the cat, uh, the cat uh, stroking suit. <laughs> it's getting weirder and weirder. Yes, didn't I tell you about the cat assembly facility where we're sitting now? No. <laughs> all right. Okay. Yeah. But to see if we are actually grounded, let's go to the machine. This is enough, only one foot is enough. Yeah, only one foot is enough. If you jump only on this fuel production facility, that's not a good idea, I guess. Okay. Yes. Right. No jumping. So now, what is this? So, what you can see here is connected foot pads. Mm -hmm. If you press the right button, get a green light. That's good, I suppose. If I now lift my foot up and press the button, Error. We are not properly connected. All right. Here we go. Okay. Very good. It's okay. 
But now. We go around this corner. Hello. So. So where are we here? This looks like a lot of stuff is being done by robots here. Yeah. So here we have the screen printer, for example. That's one line. That's when they're printed. You can see the paste on here. It's not sorted yet. Not yet? Yeah, but I want to look inside. <laughs> we have two SMD lines producing stuff for Telehouse. Okay. Well, this is more sophisticated. A bit more sophisticated than our machine, yeah. but we are almost close already. Very now close. Now the assembly line moves on. I yeah, guess there's a conveyor belt. Inspection. Conveyor belt for manual inspection. The panel is moving out here, if it's ready. Yeah. And then moving on to the reflow oven. Mm -hmm. Hot, Hot flow. flow. Yes. 314. <laughs> Lots of SMT feeders. It sounds like uh, ostrich is dying. <laughs> <laughs> the robot army is taking <laughs> over. This is where through hole components are added or manual steps or tests are done. And it all comes up to the big surf wave. Which here, there's a board traveling underneath here, if you look closely. Uh -huh. So there's liquid solder at the bottom. And the boards are preheated in here, that's why there are several zones with different temperatures and you can feel the heat here. Yeah, it's quite hot. And at some point, I think it's over here, you should see how the solder gets kind of pushed up. I don't know if you can see it properly here. Through a screen. There's a screen at the bottom, which a mask that... Ah, you see it here now. That's where the, the wave is. Wow. And when the board moves over it, only the components at the bottom, pins and so on, that touch the wave, get automatically soldered. It's they nice. cool down again here on the other side and get stored at the end. In this case, all, all components that need to be sorted, if all components, they take exactly as much solder as they exactly. need to be yes. as a part of thermal yes. pads. Yes. Like, it's sophisticated. Very sophisticated. So, where's the axio? Careful. Uh, yeah. And then they come out here at the end, that's finished now, uh -huh. and goes underneath in the storage facility. Very cool. And we have more robots here. They are currently being tested or programmed. These are for uh, labeling and testing of the Finnish timing relays, if I remember correctly. Currently all done manually, but the robot actually does it 24-7. <laughs> <Yay for robots. laughs> so, here we have uh, storage. Yeah. And component, packaging. archive, packaging, shipping, uh, more testing, packaging, labeling, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. let's go up to our office now. Because to the power office, right? To, to the power office that we use. Okay. <laughs> There's another mechanical workshop downstairs here. Mm -hmm. There's a stencil printing facility down here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Research and development, yeah. automation, sales, yeah. meeting room. <laughs> Lots of space because as you have the company doing everything in meetings and in democratized processes, mm -hmm. meeting room. But now let's go to the actual factory hub uh, offices, which is three rooms basically only. Mm -hmm. and the first one is called Uranus. I promised solar themed rooms and I can't think of any fun joke to make now. Let's go into Let's Uranus. Let's go into Uranus. <laughs> Hello. There's no one here. This looks like somebody shot a team talk here, which is crazy. I mean... <laughs> it also smells like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, we so have this is not the same thing, but smaller, I guess. Exactly the same thing as downstairs, just a tiny bit. More uh, sweat shop. Yes. Like. <laughs> so we have our reflow oven, <laughs> BGA placer, mm -hmm. manual assembly place, mm -hmm. 
stencil printer, mm -hmm. and two workspaces for general rework, cleaning, testing, soldering, and so on. Just the oven. Oh, it's here. There's the refill face oven and our refill oven. Yeah, it's really nice. Very nice. Let's go next door to our office slash testing slash pick and place facility. So we are stored or going to Mars. Now we would try and make fun of this name, but I don't know what, what names, fun names, I don't know. rhymes can you make of Mars? No. That's our pick and place machine. Almost as sophisticated as the one downstairs. Just, uh, I mean, 3% less efficient, probably. 70% more deadly than the other one. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't stack my head in here either, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so that's uh, almost running smoothly now. Here's the small brother, the light placer, mm -hmm. which is also working fine so far, also for training and slower picking and less components. Mm -hmm. And then you see incredible order here mm -hmm. Mm, with the new chocolate. IKEA cupboards everywhere. We have nice. different boxes now with labels, what's inside, <laughs> neatly organized. Is this is from IKEA? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> looks so bad. <laughs> Soldering equipment, testing equipment, hot gun, mm -hmm. hot air. Here we do mainly uh, quality assurance, take pictures of the boards in different stages, scan them, photograph them, inspect them under the microscope, photograph yeah. them, scan them, high resolution. We have a uh, remote camera, currently one setup that's not 100% complete because the image sensor is missing, but this is actually a camera for students to work on remotely. Oh, okay. Since right yes, it's, it's blinking, so they're doing something right now. <laughs> <laughs> and more beaters are going to be stacked up here with sensor, with different uh, setups like for calibration. Mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. This is an integrating sphere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All clear now? Possibly. <laughs> the idea is that since the uh, curvation is even inside all edges, uh, that if you have a light source coming in here, there's an LED inside. Mm -hmm. And it gets reflected on all sides in all angles. So Can you turn it on? Uh, no, currently not. <laughs> and uh, the idea of the integrating sphere is that the light inside the sphere is very even mm -hmm. because of the yeah. reflections on all angles. And if you put the camera here and point it inside, you get a very even illumination. So this is very convenient for testing all kinds of different sensor-related characteristics. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. What's this? That's a PCB washing machine prototype. It has a very fancy inside. Oh, la, la. This is where we insert the core to the matrix. <laughs> now, actually, we have three printed circuit boards going in here. Mm -hmm. These are made to fit. Three in a triangle. So what exactly is washed off? In uh, that's uh, when you are finished with assembly and you have flux all over the place. Mm -hmm. So the, the chemical that makes the solder liquefy better or stick better mm -hmm. to, uh, to the components. And you have to wash this off. It's a kind of grease-based chemical and it's not very nice on the surface of the of the PCB. Is is th there's no other uh, well, solvent involved? Uh, we add a uh, special cleaning fluid mm -hmm. for this very particular flux. Well, uh, and this well, goes in it. here. And then the machine turns it in this direction and that way it gets washed in all sides. But currently it's leaking, so it's not 100% perfect. <laughs> you have one, sure. <laughs> No, these alcohol-based uh, solvents, they are quite difficult to really yeah. tighten up 100%. <laughs> but yeah, currently we are doing the cleaning entirely manually. In terms of development, a lot of things happened under the hood or behind the scenes. All right. Things that are not easily displayable or obvious to see, like okay. we moved the office. There's a new power board design, which we really dive in a bit later on. We did a lot of work on the pick and place machines and hardware. 
And things are slowly getting to roll properly, so to say. We did some automation of test hardware. And the test hardware then checks if there are any shorts, if there are any missing connections, if some connections that are not supposed to be connected are connected. Mm -hmm. They run some automated tests with different interfaces. Mm -hmm. Like, is I2C working? Is it detecting all the slave addresses and so on? And this is also automated now? Now it's half automated. We have the test hardware finished, or a second set of test hardware, so we can test more hardware. Mm -hmm. And the automation of the software is something we're still working on, but it's not that complicated in terms of uh, steps to test. It's like two probes, I think. That's, uh, that's another project, a okay. flying probe machine, but okay. that's not progressing well because so many other things. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. how do you measure the... How does it, how does it uh, detect the fault? Basically, it's a loopback adapter. Mm -hmm. So most of the inputs are also outputs, so most of the outputs can also be inputs. Mm -hmm. So the idea is you loop one output to another input and then you send test signals and see where they end up. All right. So if you know I'm sending this signal on this out pin and know it should come back on this pin, then if it comes back on another pin, obviously something is not yeah. connected correctly. That's the basic theory behind this. Also the signal kind of changes. Exactly. Be predictable. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay. Sounds, sounds very useful. It is, it is. <laughs> Right, last fall we went to Google, or oh, we were invited to Google. Uh -huh. I, all I got was this t-shirt. Your, <laughs> your mic fell off. Oh no. And we attended the Google Summer of Code Mentor Summit, all right. which is basically the event where all the organizers or the people teaching the mentors from other organizations meet once a year to exchange experience, uh, see how it could be improved, share learned lessons mm -hmm. and just basically get to know each other. Mm -hmm. So the entire open source world basically for two days is localized in Mountain View and Google is uh, bringing in the food and uh, the space and the rooms for discussions. So to quickly explain what is Google Summer of Code because yeah, I guess some people know some of it but not entirely. The idea is Open source projects team up in a kind of website framework mm -hmm. with Google and Google pays students to do a kind of internship during the summer. That's why it's called Summer of Code. But uh, not in terms of internship as people are actually moving anywhere or going to an office. Yeah. Everybody is staying at home, working from home. And also the mentors, as the people from organizations who uh, cultivate or nurse or work with a student, mm -hmm. they are also staying where they are. So we have open source organizations on the one side, students from different universities on the other side, then the organizations define tasks or ideas, mm -hmm. organize them in a so-called idea page, and a student, you can look at the page and pick something that's interesting for you, or you can apply with a completely new idea that you find interesting to work on, or that's your speciality, or so on. So in the next phase, the students pick tasks and apply with the organizations, and the organizations then pick the students that seem most capable and most interesting for the summer, and Google then allocates a number of slots to each organization that okay. can be filled with these students that apply it. That's the idea. And during summer, students then get paid to work on open source projects. Oh, okay, so that's pretty cool, actually. And yeah, lots of interesting stuff that they have. Their own Google bikes, for example, mm -hmm. yeah. that you can ride around Google campus. But uh, we didn't ride any Google automated or self-driving cars. Shame. I mean, I actually went to the, to the Google Museum. <laughs> <laughs> which is in the, in the kind of old campus, I don't know. And yeah, that was very nice, two mm -hmm. days. And now it's already Google Summer of Code time again as the next season started. All right. The community bonding phase, as it's called currently, is ongoing until the end of May, if I recall correctly, and then the official coding phase begins. Mm -hmm. 
And where does this uh, information exchange happen? Is it on, on their website or is it just, do you have to organize it yourself? Uh, the kind of framework is provided by Google, mm -hmm. like you have a uh, timeline schedule, mm -hmm. they automatically send emails to all the students, all the mm -hmm. organizers, if a deadline is coming up. You have these different profiles of each organization inside the Google Summer of Code mm -hmm. page. And every student that is accepted gets his own page where the content of this task he's working on is summarized and so on. And these students, they are just like anybody? Uh, basically, any student who is officially enlisted with a university worldwide can participate in Google Summer of Code. So you need to be a student, an active student, mm -hmm. and then the rest is only applying with the proper skills, the proper ideas for the proper tasks, so to say. Did you get any feedback from some students? Uh, feedback from students? Well, last year we had three slots, which for the first time participating organization is quite a lot actually mm -hmm. because they told us it's only one or two max for starters and if you do well then maybe you get more. They seem to know that, that we need lots of help. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, because this year we got six slots. Yeah. Wow. To quickly explain, I guess... Seem really desperate. <laughs> <laughs> or we applied very well, we don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, probably you heard. Cineform has yeah. been open sourced recently. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you must have heard. It's all over the news. No, no, no. No. GoPro apparently acquired Cineform or the, the rights to use it and they open sourced it. Mm -hmm. It's nice. Very nice. We like. And since uh, Cineform has for a long time or is still the only independent, like manufacturer independent, because well, every manufacturer has his own raw codec, but Cineform is kind of a wider foundation and it's yeah. very well supported I think by now, a lot of editing software mm -hmm. can deal with it directly, so maybe in the future it would be something interesting for us, since it's open source, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I think as well. Cool. Yes, very cool. And it's actually on GitHub. You can actually download source code and everything. It's, it's real. Yeah, it's I'm not just what will happen to it now. Not just a marketing <laughs> announcement. Yeah. yeah. So uh, maybe you've also heard of ProRes RAW being announced recently. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not open source. <laughs> it's <laughs> pretty much the opposite of open source. <laughs> if you need Apple certification to use it and uh, they need to approve your product and everything. So, anybody asking, will the Axiom ever utilize Apple ProRes RAW? The answer is probably most likely <laughs> no. That's Cineform RAW. Yeah, that's <laughs> the answer is probably most definitely yes. <laughs> At least that's the philosophy or the license issue. Yeah. And another topic for Google Sum of Code. An idea or a task mentored by one of the developers by, uh, from Magic Lantern is also related to raw video container formats. Mm -hmm. And the task is to evaluate the different options, find out the pros and cons, do some tests with, in terms of write speed and encoding speed. On the one hand, we have DNG or Cinema DNG, mm -hmm. the container for multiple frames. And on the other hand, we have Magic Lantern Video, which is used in all their firmware for writing raw yeah. video. And so each of these containers or formats have different cons and pros and cons, different drawbacks and advantages. And the task of this student, and he is taking care of this summer or with the Magic Lantern developer, is uh, evaluating differences and seeing what would be best suited for the mm -hmm. Beta. Mm -hmm or even adapting the Magic Lantern video format because it's a standard that's easily extendable to accommodate things that we are discovering now or seeing that we need more than mm -hmm. Magic Lantern needed it before, for example, in terms of metadata, file structure and so on. Cool. Yes. It's a good project. Very good. Also for the students, it's a good project. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. It's very interesting. Yes. So, there's another project in Google Summer of Code called uh, implementing different debugging methods in OpenCine. Mm -hmm. You know OpenCine, the 
software, yeah. open source raw video development suite. That's actually happening now and <laughs> progress. And Were there any doubts about it? No, no, the, just the question was when, and the answer is now. <laughs> so OpenSynia is happening. Yes. There are pull requests being made right now. And, and if I want to participate? Yeah. To Please do, anybody can participate. Anything. I mean, there are a couple of tasks from Google Summer of Code that are being taken care of now by students, but there are even other tasks who don't have anyone working on it. Mm. So that's a very good starting point to pick up the task and work with the mentor, which isn't really your mentor then <laughs> in the Google Sum of Code sense, but he's still able to help you and guide you and give you tasks and, and tell you where to start and what to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested, OpenSynA is looking for, for contributions. Another Google Sum of Code task is implementing live histogram, mm -hmm. vector scope, waveform, this kind of tools inside yeah. the camera. So first a software running on the camera as C software. And ultimately, if the progress is uh, done in a timely manner, also in FPGA mm -hmm. accelerated tasks, you know, like in overlays, you have these tiny histograms in, yeah. uh, in the menu, uh, vector scopes and waveform is sometimes available in monitors or recorders, but in cameras, sometimes. Yeah, histogram. Histogram, definitely, that's the tool most cameras supply. And with this Google Summer of Code task, that's also developed inside the Exum Beta. Nice, and like focus peaking and stuff. Uh, peaking is another topic, but I'm not sure if somebody picked it up this year. Picked it up. Picked it up, yes. <laughs> Another, uh, yeah, it is actually picked up. <laughs> picked up. So more Google Summer of Code tasks. When students are uh, working on image sensor emulation. Okay. Yes. What does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, <coughs> you don't need a physical image sensor to develop stuff around the image sensor, okay. like FPGA logic. All right. So you emulate the sensor with some demo output, like okay. test okay. pattern or so. That's a good thing to... Yes, because the image sensor is very expensive, unfortunately, and yes. uh, if you can do stuff without it, be a developer or whatever you want to do, that's useful, definitely. Yeah. The last student or this last project is called uh, the FPG Bidirectional Packet Protocol. Doesn't ring any bells. <laughs> Why not? I'm very <laughs> surprised now. So, if you remember, the Axiom Beta main board yes has two shield connectors. Mm -hmm. Two shield connectors on the east and two shield connectors on the west side. Mm -hmm. and they are these, like in a heavy gang war. With yes, each other. yes. Yeah. It's like West Side Story. <laughs> <laughs> east Side Story. <laughs> All over. And they want to talk to each other, but they're not allowed to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because of their parents. Yeah, yeah because of the, the parents living in the FPGA. Yeah. And there are two lattice FPGAs underneath each slot one. Mm -hmm. And uh, they extend the I.O. of the main FPGA on the microset. But to really utilize these connections to the shields and interpret them with different protocols like I2C or SPI buses, mm -hmm. you need to define a way how this SPI bus or whatever bus it is goes to the lattice, is interpreted there or encoded and with packets sent to the sync, the FPGA on the microset. This is already the hardware. Is, it's, it's all already. hardware, basically. Yeah. Since you talk about FPGA code also as hardware, that's mm. all hardware. No, but I mean the, the hardware is already designed to do Yes, this. the hardware is already there. Mm -hmm. Now it's a matter of how to use it. Mm -hmm. So for anything going on the shields, to make the interconnectivity to the main like operating system of the camera running on the sync, the Linux, uh, you need to define a kind of pathway, a connectivity, yeah. a communication, and that's what the bidirectional packet protocol is. I see, now I understand. Mm -hmm. I don't know what this uh, metaphor is for, according to romantic, forbidden love interests, but that's okay. Makes no sense, so it's very <laughs> romantic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, nice. Very good. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Until next time.